Good morning. Good morning. My name is Beth Hansen, and I am representing the Board of Deacons this morning. We welcome you to our service and pray God's blessing upon you and your family as you worship with us. I would also like to welcome those joining us online as we worship. Wherever you are in life, know that you are welcome here with us. If you are a visitor this morning, we are delighted that you are joining us today. Thank you and welcome. The welcomer of the day is Suzanne Moriando. Please stand up. If you are new or would like more information about the church, please see her after the service. If you would like to have our deacons and prayer team join you in praying for a concern or joy this week, please fill out one of the blue or green prayer cards and place it in the box on the historic communion table at the back of the sanctuary, which is back on that side. If you are sitting in the center aisle, please sign the Book of Friendship and pass it through your pew. When it comes back, please note the names of people you may not know so that you can greet them following the service. The October-November edition of 60 Days of Prayer is now available. You can find it on the lectern with the Book of Joys and Concerns at the rear of the sanctuary, also back there. The deacons hope that you will take a copy to incorporate in your daily reflections. Join us for the Spirit of Shrewsbury Parade this afternoon. Line up is at 1230 on Church Road next to Chiampa. Parade begins at 1 p.m. 18th century costumes are encouraged. We will be walking up behind a float with a model of the church. Please arrange for transportation from Oak Middle School back to the church. Alternatively, you may walk back the parade route from Oak Middle School to the church after the parade. This afternoon, we are the host for the Central Association United Church of Christ annual meeting. The speaker will be Reverend Eric Ellie from the Southern New England Conference. He will be discussing the Find Hope Now initiative. The event is open to all. Feel free to come by the church at 3 p.m. Next Sunday, Mission and Outreach will have a special offering for neighbors in need. It is a special mission offering of the United Church of Christ that supports ministries of justice and compassion throughout the United States. The focus of this year's special offering is on mental health justice. You may place your check in the offering plate using the NIN envelopes, which will be in the basket on the usher's table. Please indicate NIN in the comment section of your check. Mail your donation to the church office or make an online donation through the church website. And now we have a couple of announcements from Jean and Larry. We're, kick, we're kicking off our stewardship campaign. If you haven't already, you should have gotten a letter in the mail with a, a pledge card um, talking about the campaign. So um, if you can, read the letter and make a pledge to the church. If you haven't gotten a letter, please notify the church office. They'll be happy to send one out to you. Um, and for the next few Sundays, we will be having stewardship moments where we've asked people that are members of the congregation who pledge to talk about why they pledge to the church. Um, and today, we're going to have David Snook. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I believe that this church is a very special place. Uh, when my wife and I first moved to Shrewsbury in 1991 as a young couple without kids, we were immediately welcomed by this wonderful congregation. Our children, Rachel and Daniel, were, were uh, baptized here and they both attended Sunday school, now called Kid Zone here. One very special thing about this church is that everyone is welcome. Our attendees come from many different religious backgrounds and religious interpretation is up to the individual. The good news of the Christian message is given here for everyone. As a deacon, I've met many dedicated con congregation members who do so much to keep this institution alive and running. 
One has no idea how many hours some of our members contribute to this church. I've been both impressed and humbled by their commitment. During this stewardship season, please think about how much you have received from this wonderful church. The Sunday services alone is a time to stop, rest, and reflect are worth so much. Our church also gives a significant amount of its resources to helping others in the broader community. All of this does not come by accident, but is due to the commitment and financial giving of our members. I encourage all of you to reflect on what this church means to you and the important work it does for so many as you make your stewardship pledge. I know you heard Beth when she announced that this afternoon our church is hosting the Central Massachusetts Association annual meeting. It's made up of 77 churches throughout Central Massachusetts and a large number of representatives from those 77 churches will be here this afternoon and as a member of this church I'm proud that we are hosting them. But I'm also the moderator of the association and I have a need. We need four people to act as greeters as people arrive so they know where to go, where the restrooms are, where to, where to sit and so on. So if anyone, or actually if four people, could be available this afternoon from 2.30 to 4.30, all you need to do is be a friendly face and point out where things are. I would be very grateful. So please see me afterwards if you can devote two hours and make our church the welcoming community that I know it is. Thank you. Thank you. Rejoice. Rejoice and be glad because the Spirit of God is indeed in this place. The Spirit of God has descended upon each and every one of us, welcoming us into the faith and family of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God will be present today in the sacrament of baptism and in the work of our hands. May we celebrate the goodness of God's love and strive to share that love with others. I would invite you to join with me in our call to worship. Happy are those who are steadfast in faith, who show forth the mercy and compassion of God. In faith we have uttered what we do not understand, for the ways of God are too wonderful even for us. We believe we will see God's goodness and be led through pathways that bring life. Our opening hymn is found in the Red uh, Pew Hymnal. It is our Pilgrim Hymnal number 20.
You may be seated. Before the awesome majesty of the Eternal One, our thoughts and deeds can become like millstones around our necks. Eyes and hands and feet have led us away from the ways of God. Yet our hearts say we will seek God's face. Let us pour out our sin before the one who offers us forgiveness. May we pray together. Compassionate and merciful God, in our worst moments, we despise ourselves. We know what is right, but we fail to do it. We are easily deceived by voices other than yours. When we seek your face, our vision is clouded by self-interest. When we intend to do your will, easier paths beckon, and we follow them. Forgive us, God, as we repent. Listen now to the comforting words of God's forgiveness. God does not cast us off or forsake us. Our Creator does not give us up to the will of our adversaries. Mercy and forgiveness are offered to us as gifts from God. Let us receive them with joy and gratitude. Amen. We are delighted to share in the sacrament of baptism. Hear these words, members and friends in Christ. We gather now to celebrate the gift of grace in the sacrament of baptism. There is one body and one spirit. There is one hope in God's call to us. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and creator of us all. At this moment, I would like to invite Curtis and Kimberly, Phoebe and Clara and their godparents forward. Curtis and Kimberly, do you desire to have your children baptized into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? If so, say we do. And now as parents and as godparents, will you encourage these children to renounce the powers of evil and to receive the freedom of new life in Christ? If so, we will. Will you teach these children that they may be led to profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If so, we will. We will. (laughs) Do you promise, by the grace of God, to be Christ's disciples, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, and to show the love and justice of Jesus as best you are able, If so, we do. And will you promise, according to the grace given to you, to grow with these children in the Christian faith, to help these beautiful girls to be faithful members of the family of Jesus Christ, celebrating Christ's presence and furthering Christ's mission in all the world, so that they too may recognize God's presence in their lives and come to affirm their baptism. If so, we do. And now to all of you who are gathered here today, friends and visitors, family and neighbors, Jesus Christ calls all of us to make disciples of all nations, to offer them the gift of grace in baptism. Do you who witness and celebrate this sacrament Promise your love, support, and care to the ones about to be baptized as they live and grow in Christ.
We thank you, God, for the gift of creation called forth by your saving word. Before the world had shape and form, your spirit moved over the waters. Out of the waters of the deep, you formed the firmament and brought forth life to sustain all of the earth. In the time of Noah, you washed the waters of the earth with the waters of the flood, and your ark bore a salvation of new beginning. In the time of Moses, your people Israel passed through the Red Sea waters from slavery to freedom and crossed the flowing Jordan to enter into the promised land. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus Christ, who was nurtured by the water of Mary's womb, it was Jesus himself who was baptized by John in the River Jordan and became living water to the woman at the Samaritan well. It was Jesus who washed the feet of his disciples and sent them forth to baptize the nations by water and by the Holy Spirit. Gracious God, we implore that your Holy Spirit be upon this water and upon this sacred act that each of those who may be touched by this experience may grow in faith and service, that the fruits of your spirit may be compassion and justice and mercy. We pray this in your name. Amen. By what name will this child be known? Phoebe Ann, will you let me hold you? No? Okay. You stay with Daddy. Daddy's Curtis, step over here. Phoebe Ann, I baptize you this day in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Phoebe Ann, you are a precious child of God. May you know strength and compassion. May you grow in service to the Lord and service to one another, that you may always know that you are welcome and precious in God's sight. Amen. By what name will this child be known? Hi, Clara May. Clara May, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Clara May, may you know grace and mercy and forgiveness. May you know that you are a beloved child of God who may grow into the fullness of your calling ever confident that what you strive to do is part of God's plan. Amen. I would like to introduce these two beautiful girls to the congregation. Curtis, will you walk with me with Phoebe? All right, congregation, meet these two new beautiful children of God's family. Curtis, we'll walk up. You go to that side, I'll go to this side. Hi, it's Clara. Hi. Hi, good morning. This is Clara. Hi, this is Clara. Hi. All right, you go that way, I'll go this way. Hi, this is Clara. Hi, Clara. Look at all these people. Hi, there's Dave. Here's Tony. All right, Robin and Steve. Hi, good morning. There's Conrad. Here's Kristen and Norma. Good morning. Good morning, and Paul and Penelope and John. Good morning. You know these people. You know these people. We have baptism certificates and flowers. All right, thank you everyone, thank you.
They were terrific. Oh. I would like to invite forward anyone young in age or young in heart for our children. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to see you. Hi, everybody. Hi, C. 
see a couple people brought some stuffies today. I. All right. Well, you know what? I brought a little stuffy today too. What did I bring? A dove. Why do you think I would bring a dove today? Yes, Lincoln. Oh, because a dove came to Noah's Ark. That's a great reason, Penelope. Because the dove delivered a message from Noah's Ark to God. What do you think, Maddie? A dove is a sign of peace. Can anyone else think of a time where you see a dove? Yes, Sylvie. The dove finds land. It finds a safe place for us. Those are all beautiful. And we, I don't know how many of you looked at the bulletin this morning, but there's a picture of a dove on the bulletin too. Because a dove is the symbol of God's Holy Spirit. And we hear about it when we hear about Noah's Ark and the dove coming. And we hear about it when Jesus himself gets baptized and a dove come down from the sky. And we hear about the Holy Spirit at the time of Pentecost, which is the birthday of the church. So we, I want, uh, do you guys know anything about doves? Like anything about the bird? Yeah? It brings you good luck. It brings you good luck. Do you know the only place where a dove does not live? The only continent that doesn't have doves. Antarctica. That's right. So God's Holy Spirit can be found all over the earth, and it can be found in cities and farms and suburbs. There is no part of God's creation where a dove can't survive and thrive, except for some reason Antarctica. Yes, Karina. Yeah, I do. I have doves on my stool, too, because, again, they are symbols of God's Holy Spirit. And so I want you, whenever you see a dove outside, to think there is a symbol or a sign of God's love. Will you, let's do an echo prayer. An echo prayer means you repeat after me. Loving God, Loving God. Send, your spirit, send your spirit like a beautiful dove. Upon each of us, so we may know and live in your love. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome to go to Kid Zone or Tiny Ones to Nursery. Good morning. The scripture reading today is from Numbers 11, verses 4 to 6, 10 to 16, and 24 to 29. The camp followers with them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat! We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to eat or look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry and Moses was distressed and displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give birth to them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a wet nurse carries nursing a child? to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to feed these people? For they come weeping to me saying, give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone for they are too heavy for me. 
if this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once if I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 of the elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad. And the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered but they had not gone out to the tent, so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told me, Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men said, my Lord, Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. There ends the reading. Now the Bible is a pretty impressive book. There's a lot of things in here. There are words of law and poems. There are prayers and history. But I'm going to invite us to think a little bit differently about this particular passage from Numbers. And I want us to think about it as a case study. A case study in church leadership. Now, last week, we held a deacon's retreat with both members of the deacons and the care team, and we did some case studies as a way to practice and think about visitation with other church members. It was a wonderful way for us to exercise our creativity and to think about the possibilities of how we could engage. So I want us to think about the passage that we just heard as a case study in biblical leadership. Now Moses. Moses was a fine, strong man. Moses was a man who was literally born for leadership. And he was the epitome of a hierarchical leader. Moses became a symbol of the Hebrews' people's a sign of God's promise, and a symbol of God's possibility for liberation. So if you want the backstory, it's provided in the Bible, and I'll give you a thumbnail. Remember, Moses was born at a time when all Hebrew boys were declared to be anathema, and that the Pharaoh wanted genocide to kill every small boy of the Hebrew people. And so, Moses' mother placed him gently in a bed of reeds and floated him down the river, where Pharaoh's own daughter found him and adopted him as her own. Moses grows up in the Pharaoh's household, but he gets in trouble because later, as a young adult, he kills an Egyptian who was harassing a Hebrew man. So Moses flees, and when he flees into the wilderness, that is where God finds him and speaks to him through a burning bush. God sends Moses, the reluctant leader, back to the Pharaoh, where Moses brings on the plagues and parts the Red Sea and leads the people into the wilderness. It is where he goes up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, and he comes back down. Moses is a 
very effective CEO. He's surrounded by all the right people, but he's the one in charge. But now, but now when we read the case study from the book of Numbers, we hear that the people are tired and whiny and grumbling. They don't like the food. Now really, when you hear somebody whining that they don't like the food, Usually that means that there is something deeper underneath it. When you hear about complaints on a surface issue, there's usually something more. There's usually something deeper that is creating the unrest, but the presenting issue is that the people want meat. Really, they want meat because, well, because they're tired and because they've been displaced, and because they don't have their own beds to rest in, and because they are scared and they want something familiar, they have been uprooted. They have been chased across the Red Sea. Their feet have blisters. They are worn out. This is hard. And the promised land has not yet materialized. And so as the people grumble for meat, what they are really saying is that we don't know where we are headed and we know it is not what we know and we are not sure what lies ahead. But Moses too, Moses too is burnt out by this point and he asks God to fix it. And God responds, and I think this is very curious, God responds to the situation not by replacing the CEO, not by calling a board meeting and firing the hierarchical boss and calling in a new CEO, or as we find in current uh, corporations, bringing back the old CEO who makes it all feel good and familiar, right? That's not what God does, instead, God reimagines the leadership structure. God completely redoes the org chart of God's people. It's fascinating. Having one person in charge, as Moses has been for all of these years, can be exhausting, and it's not particularly an effective way for management. A single leader can become myopic and can suppress diversity or dissent. But the people, the people are grumbling and they are disoriented and God comes to help. So what God does is instruct Moses to gather 70 of the elders to prophesy and to have visions, to have a hope for the future. So if that were the whole story, okay, Moses, you find 70 men, put them out in the wilderness, I will bless them, and we shall go on our merry way. If that was the case study, it would be nice. It would be safe. Perhaps not as compelling as the fact that the two men, the two men, Eldad and Medad, did you catch that? There's two of them that don't show up with the others. They stay back in the village among the people and are also blessed by God's spirit. So this is interesting. This is interesting. Why does, why does the Bible go out of its way to tell us about Eldad and Medad, even naming them for us? It scares Joshua. Wait, wait, Th this wasn't part of our org plan. These two are outside of the boundaries of what we said was okay. These two need to be reprimanded. They need to go see HR. They need to go be put back in their place. And here is where I think the most transformative part of the message comes. That Moses says, oh, oh, leave them be. Oh, that all people might have the Spirit of God upon them. Moses 
is elated. He is not threatened by sharing leadership. He is excited that more people are there to do the work, to share the burden, and to bring God's spirit to even more people. That's the model that we have as the church. That is the gift of the Holy Spirit that is shared by us and shared by our children in the act of baptism. It is a form of shared leadership that is one of empowerment. It is not a type of leadership that is bore of delegating. Moses doesn't go and create a nice triangle and pass down his exact commands for organizing the community. But instead, it is a grassroots effort, bore of God's spirit, that says, oh, that all of us might feel like we have a stake in this. Oh, that all of us might have a part of caring for one another. Oh, that all of us might be responsible for caring for each other now that we are out in the wilderness. Oh, that all of us might have a part to play. That is the beauty of God's spirit. And that's the thing, that it is not chaos, even though more people have been empowered, Because it is the same spirit, it is God's spirit that is uniting them. We actually hear in the case study from Numbers that it, God takes the spirit that was in Moses and distributes it among the people, that they have a common vision and a common spirit and now they share a common purpose. So many hands. Many hands make light the work. And so you have many hands. You each have two hands, the paper ones and the real ones. We are about to enter into our stewardship season as our congregation. And we are empowered to do the work of God's spirit. We are empowered to share the gifts of God for all the people of God. And so our hands will be transformed into a beautiful piece of art, but first, you've got a couple minutes, you've got between now and the offering, to write on your hands, on one hand on the the side that is white, the paper side, I want you to write a prayer for the church. Whether you're a visitor or you're a longtime member, just a prayer for the church that it continues to grow, that it continues to have joy, that it continues, whatever the prayer is. And then on the other hand, we know that we are part of a hurting world. We know that we are still people in the wilderness. We know that there are still places of famine where the people are hungry and displaced. And so I want you to write a prayer for the world on the other hand. And pass those in when we pass the offering plates. Put your paper hands in the plate and we will transform them when you return next week. But what I want you to know is that you, you bear God's spirit. You are part of the rich legacy of the Christian faith. You are the continuation of the people of God's story, the people of the Bible. And that while we may study it, we also live it. So that our case studies are not just theory or hypotheses but that we are the living embodiment, the flesh of God's people for this time and for this place. May we do so sharing always in the spirit and vision that God provides. Amen. Each week we pause to offer prayers for one another and for the world. I have a few here today. One, I want to offer a prayer for healing. Pastor Karen is not feeling well. That's why she's not with us this morning. So we hope that she has a quick and speedy recovery. 
Uh, we also want to offer, we were at the Spirit of Shrewsbury booth yesterday, and we offered a sheet for people to write prayers down, and there was a lovely woman, her name is Vo Robert, and she is donating a kidney this week. And so she asked for prayers both for herself and for the recipient. We have two fantastic prayers from Erin Consano. First, prayers for her daughter, Annie, who is at this moment running the Berlin Marathon in Germany. Prayers for her safe finish and safe travels home. And even as exciting, prayers this coming week for Aaron's son, James, and his fiance as they will get married this upcoming weekend. Prayers for those with dementia and for those who care for them. Prayers for the continued violence in the Middle East, particularly as it continues to spread into Lebanon and Syria and Egypt, Israel and Gaza. Prayers for those who are experiencing the flooding here in our own country from Florida to the Carolinas and the devastation and disruption that such natural disasters wreak. Other prayers from the congregation today. Suzanne? Prayers for your nephew whose illness is making it difficult for him to eat. Okay. We have been praying for Dainey's friend Don, who has been in Ukraine on a humanitarian trip, and he has returned safely. We are thankful for all of those who risk their lives to care for others. May we go to God in a spirit of prayer. Holy One, when we grumble about the food, when we grumble about the busyness of our lives, when we grumble about the scarcity we perceive, help remind us that there is something bigger, that there is something greater, that your mystery and love, your capacity for goodness is greater than any of our grumbles. Help us, God, to care for those who are sick and are grieving, those who need to see the light of compassion in another's eyes and to feel a hand of strength reach out and lift them up. Help us, God, to be humble enough to receive those hands when they are offered to us as well, that we not think so highly of ourselves that we cannot, too, be served by others in your name. God, we pray for our congregation and our community. We pray for the vastness of this world and that the places of brokenness and of hurt may be soothed by the dove of peace and by the spirit of grace. God, we pray these things because we believe in your son, Jesus Christ, the one who is baptized in the waters of the River Jordan, the one whom you called beloved, who has shared his love with us, he has also shared these words as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Each month we have been sharing as part of our offering ways in which we are engaging with our community. And Norma has an update for us from Sage Place. Hi, everyone. My name is Norma Garcia, and I'd like to share a little, about, a little about our ongoing outreach of Sage Place. 
It's a group home dedicated to supporting adults and uh, with mental health problems. Now, since joining the mission and outreach team in 2014, I had the privilege of bringing joy to the residents in a special way. Each month, we celebrate the, the birthdays of the residents by delivering a birthday cake and a gift bag with a birthday card and a Walmart gift card inside. This simple gesture not only brings smiles, but also fosters a sense of community and belonging. It is a reminder that everyone deserves to feel loved and celebrated, no matter what their circumstances. Witnessing the joy of the residents as they receive the, their cake and gift bar, bag is truly, truly heartwarming. It strengthens our bonds and helps remind them that they are valued members of our community. Our visits are not just about the cake and gift, no. They are about connection, support, and spreading God's love continuing to make a positive impact on the lives of these individuals is the goal. And in closing, I pray that the residents of Sage Place may feel the love of God and our community in their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Norma. Mm -hmm. Once again, the opportunity is ours to proclaim the goodness of God through offering ourselves and the first fruits of our labors. May all that we give be a testimony to God's purposes among us. May we share in our prayer of dedication. All that we give is first a gift from you, O God. It is a joy to invest in the mission of the church, both as a gathered community in this place and as a scattered people who long for connection. May our offerings reach where we ourselves cannot go and bring wholeness to the broken places of this world. Amen. Our closing hymn is Lift Every Voice, and we will sing just verse 1. It is number 593.
be seated. As you go forth into this coming week, may you do so empowered by the gifts of God's spirit. Know, like Moses, you are not responsible for carrying everyone, but that we are empowered as a community of faith, as a community of people who share God's vision and God's spirit to lift up one another as we lift up every voice and sing of God's peace, of God's promise, of God's hope. Go and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.